Uh, thanks everyone for being here. I, I'm Steele Wagstaff. I have a background in English literature and in library information studies, and I now work for the College of Letters and Science. I work for a support arm called Learning Support Services, and I'm an instructional technology consultant. And I wanted to ask, by, start by asking, how many of you have written a dissertation or a book of some kind in your career or in your life? Maybe half of the room. How many of you have published that dissertation or that book? Okay. How many of you have written or published a textbook? Okay. So we have at least one person in the room that's done all of those things. I think the experience of doing any of those things, it's daunting, it's very time consuming, it requires a high degree of content expert knowledge. And on the other side, the publishing arrangement is also typically really opaque and complex for those of us who are content experts. We expect publishers to do a lot of things that will transform and add value. One thing we expect them to do is to edit and copy, or uh, proofread the copy to make sure that it's ready for publication. Another thing we hope that they do is they transform the page and they produce layout. We hope that they're gonna market the book. We hope they're gonna handle and manage all the sales. And then probably more than anything, we hope that they're gonna distribute royalties. <laughs> we can retire early, right? So we think about all the traditional roles that publishers have fulfilled, and we, and we think historically about print text. Print objects have been really durable. The, 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 the reason why I started thinking about this was that there was a pilot, there have been several pilots on our campus, that focused and looked at producing electronic texts, book-length documents of various kinds that would be published and distributed electronically, either beginning on the web or ending on the web in some way. And the pilot was very interesting. A lot of very smart people worked together, worked very hard to make a variety of projects. But in the end, one of the things that really hampered that project was the lack of a suitable tool, an authoring environment, that met all of the particular needs for both the technologists and for the instructors who wanted to write and publish the text. I, I saw that experience and I looked at that and I thought, you know, this feels kind of frustrating, the lack of an available tool. And before I make a tool or before we think about doing the next phase of this project, it's probably important for us to sit down and say, what are the key principles? What are the things that really matter to us that we want this authoring environment to be able to do for our content experts? So I generated a list that then shaped the construction or the decision making around the tool that I'm going to present. I'll share that with you kind of quickly. The first and most important thing that I think is a service to all of you is that the tool itself should be easy for non-technical users to work with. You should not have to know how to code or to assemble a publishing environment yourself. You should know how to input interesting content. You should be able to know how to write in a word processor, essentially, to be able to use this tool. The second thing that uh, I felt was important as a principle uh, is that it be collaborative and it have a ro robust version control, which means you should be able to go back and look at previous edits and previous versions and restore them if needed, and to work on the project with multiple people. If you have co-authors or you have people in your program that you're working to produce material with, it needs to do those things and allow for those things to happen. The third thing, uh, if you're thinking about just turning print text into e-text, there's hundreds of tools that can already do that and can do that just fine. In fact, I think in many ways, durable print may be better if you're just trying to take text and make it into text. But there are some things that the internet or that electronic text can do that print text struggle to do. And some of those would be to include multimedia. If you want audio and video embedded or native to your text, it's very hard to do that with print. You can include a CD or include a DVD, but you can't integrate it with the same degree of deep integration as you can with an electronic text. The other thing that I felt was important to include would be if we want to make learning objects or learning materials, students should be able to engage with some new content and then practice or do some kind of interactive activity that they can do formative assessment, they can, uh, they can engage with you or with some questions or with some knowledge forming activities to be able to get a sense for how well they know the material, what they need to practice, the kinds of things that you might do in a quizzing environment should be able to be embedded and be native to this authoring environment so you can make robust learning happen. The fourth principle, uh, this is a kind of nerd technical side, but it is very important, and I hope everybody pays attention to it, is that the tool itself should be based on broadly accepted web standards. It should be 
uh, open source when possible. That's a personal feeling, but that's one of my principles. It should be device or platform agnostic. You should be able to author on whatever device you like to use, and you should be able to access content on whatever device you like to use. And it should be accessible. This was the point that Todd brought up. It should be accessible to, to learners and to authors with all different uh, kinds of abilities. And so it needs to meet federal guidelines and local guidelines for what it means to be fully accessible. So those are kind of core principles here. The fifth one, this was very important to me, and it's one of the key distinctions. Is we're working in a space where a lot of content is produced for proprietary purposes by proprietary organizations. There can be some value to that. Traditional publishing has enriched our lives in lots of ways. But their goals and their ambitions are often different from ours as educators. So if we're authoring in this, we should own the content. The creators should own the content. They should be able to license it however they like, including to openly license it under a Creative Commons copyright license, which doesn't have the same copyright restrictions. And you should be able to export or to produce your content in whatever format within reason you want to put it into. It should be able to go into PDF or a Word document or into a website or into an EPUB or a Mobi file so people can read it and distribute it in any one of the kind of commonly accepted uh, open formats for uh, text content. And the last principle that was important for me is that once this content is finished, it should be able to stand alone and just live on the web if you want to live on the web. Or if you're teaching a course in a learning management system like D2L or Moodle or Canvas, you should be quickly and you should be able to quickly and easily bring this content into your learning management system and have it function the way it's supposed to function with some grade reporting, with some analytics, and all the other things that you might expect from a learning management system. So that's the big wish list. And what I want to present today is that um, we have a tool that I think accomplishes close to 90 to 95% of these things, and we will get to 100% by uh, the end of this year. Um, the first project that we had was this thing right here. It looks forbidding, it looks intense. You drop it from a high <coughs> distance, you know, it's quite uh, loud. This is a Portuguese language textbook. It's been in use on our campus for 50 years in various forms. It was developed in the 1960s by some faculty here. The last revision that was made on this was in 1993. It's still in use in I think half a dozen or more colleges and universities around the country. But at its peak, it was being used I think by 20 to 30 different departments and programs. Many of them have uh, stopped using it because it has not been updated since 1993. So mm -hmm. for example, you're practicing your future tense verbs and it asks you what you plan to do in 1999. And it's a future tense question. And in some ways, it's not a future tense question anymore. So <laughs> there's a, that's just an example of the revisions that are needed. And so it's a great learning object. There's lots of really cool uh, activities and resources here and really profound content expertise. Uh, there's a mastery of language and of grammar. And students learn a lot from using this text. But the program felt that this text uh, could be better and should be revised. And so I said, this is a perfect kind of test case for what we want to do. And so this was the first uh, real project that we used our open author environment to bring in into um, a digital form. And it's uh, mostly finished right now, and I will show it to you here. This is our new first digital edition of this text. The cover you can see is, I hope it's a bit more attractive. I designed it. <laughs> it was a very quick design project, but you'll see here's the text. There's a description of it. You can read it by clicking on this link, or if you'd like, they've made it available in four formats, EPUB 3, EPUB, Mobi, and PDF. There are clear limitations of these formats. They are fixed form, and not all of the interactive activities are available in all of these formats, but they're portable. If I want to open it up on my iPad and read it, I could use any one of those things. If I wanted to read it on my Kindle, I could download the Mobi. If I wanted to make a print copy, I could download the PDF and print it at a local printer or on my own machine. If I want to use the full text, though, I can read and interact with it. I could come to the first lesson, and I could click on lesson one. And it's free and open on the web. You have the beginning of the chapter. You have the lesson objectives. You have some verb tables. And what they've done at, is at several points in the lesson, they have these interactive activities. This helps students to practice 
conjugation for verbs. You have to decide whether you use ser or a star here. And so they would click on a star. And they got the first one right, so it's going to present another question. So far, I'm guessing really well. I really am not. Oh, I got that one wrong. So it's telling, I could turn the sound off here. Sounds cool. It is. It's very nice if you like annoying sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so we worked through these. We've done several of them. I'm guessing quite well. And then it's going to tell me at the end, this is a six-question activity. It's going to give me a kind of uh, assessment of score. If I would like to see the answers or the solutions, I can ask, click on this, and it will display solutions for me. If I want to retry it, I'll retry it. This is a, a kind of module that we've baked in to do interaction. It's called H5P. And I won't go into great detail about it, but you'll be exploring and seeing it here. This is HTML5 accessible content. It's built to be broadly useful. You can use it on your iPad. You can use it on your phone. You can use it on mobile devices. And it will function. It will work. It should not break. There's a number of different types of activities. They have another fill in the blank activity <coughs> here where they're having to produce vocabulary words. And this allows students to do some formative assessment as they're working through this assignment. That's an example of a transformation that we've made to a text that we feel like has improved the text and it's made it more broadly useful. It's currently in use right now with one course. In the fall, once we finish all of these revisions and build in some more data to it, it's going to be in use, I believe, across all the Portu introductory Portuguese language courses. And we're working on a maybe a half dozen to 10 other similar projects right now where we're hoping to develop this. Um, I applied for and received a small EI grant that's uh, going to allow us to provide central hosting for this. And we want to make this available as a campus level service to anybody with a net ID. Uh, very, very soon. As soon as I, um, I have the full cooperation from some do-it people, then we will make that happen, I think. And uh, it's coming, and it will be coming soon, and we'd really like anyone who's interested in using this to become content creators and to publish the content that you'd like to use for your courses or your programs. So that's the big story. Um, I think we're about at time for what I wanted to say. Um, so I, what I guess I want to do is uh, open it up and let people start playing with it.